Hello, I'm Larry Wilson, and welcome to this segment in our study on the seven seals. You know, there are many purposes for the end time scenario written in the book of Revelation, and the most essential purpose is knowing that mankind has a Savior in Jesus Christ. As I said, 75% of the world reject or don't know about Jesus. And the 25% of the world that claims to be Christian, I suppose a much smaller percentage of people really love and know Jesus out of that group. <laughs> so the many purposes that God has, he, he is so deliberate and thoughtful about His creations, and everything He does serves many purposes. The book of Revelation explains the revelation of Jesus because mankind desperately needs a Savior. And there's good news. We have one who loves us so much that He died for us. But most of the world's population does not understand their need of a Savior, number one. They don't understand who Jesus really is and what He's all about, nor His love and character. And third, they have no idea what He's about to do. So Jesus will impose His wrath on mankind, and I say justifiably so, when He breaks the fourth seal, and His 144,000 will be empowered to inform the world about Jesus and His gospel, the truth about God. And one of the most interesting things that Jesus will use to press His truth home to our hearts will be the opposing efforts and forces of evil men and Lucifer. Let me say that again. One of the most interesting things that Jesus will use to press His truth home to our hearts during the Great Tribulation will be the opposing efforts and forces of evil men and Lucifer. This is why the behavior of the wicked is given so much attention in the book of Revelation. Jesus will use the behavior of wicked men and angels, wicked angels, to bring about desperate circumstances so that every honest person can see the enormity of sin and realize his need of a Savior. Let me, let me try to summarize this again. This is a crucial point. The book of Revelation covers the dragon and the beast and the martyrdom of the saints and all kinds of things. And it also covers the revelation of Jesus in the seven seals because these things are necessary to help us to understand that we desperately need a Savior. But at the present time, most of the world doesn't understand this need. So, in His wrath, Jesus will impose a tribulation upon the world. The 144,000 will be empowered to present the everlasting gospel, and the opposing efforts and the forces of wicked people and Lucifer will put honest-hearted people in a situation where they realize their need of a Savior. How clever! Good news! A numberless multitude of people will discover their need for Jesus, and they will accept His generous terms and conditions for salvation, and they will rejoice to know and receive Jesus as their Savior, persecution notwithstanding. Now that you know these things, you're ready to hear about the fifth seal. So let's go to the computer screen and let's notice the fifth seal. When he opened, that is when the Lamb opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the Word of God and the testimony they had maintained. They called out in a loud voice, How long, Sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood. Then each of them was given a white robe, and they were told to wait a little longer, until the number of their fellow servants and brothers who were to be killed as they had been 
was completed. So what is the fifth seal all about? Sometime after the fourth seal is broken and the Great Tribulation begins, according to my calculations about three years later, there will be a great slaughter of the saints. A great slaughter of the saints. This is why John writes, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been, what? Slain. We're not talking about the saints who die of laryngitis, <laughs> or pneumonia, or cancer, or accidents. We're talking about the saints that were slain because of the Word of God. That is, they were faithful in obeying the Word of God. And the testimony they had maintained, that is, they would not surrender or capitulate. So we're talking here about people who are slain, murdered, because of the Word of God and the testimony they had maintained. What does this language mean, souls under the altar that had been slain? Some people use this text to demonstrate that when martyrs die for Jesus, they go to heaven and live under the altar. They say, quote, John heard them speaking. So these martyrs must be alive. I hear that quite often. But look at this text, Genesis 4, 9. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is your brother Abel? I don't know, he replied. Am I my brother's keeper? The Lord said, What have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Did Abel's blood audibly speak to God? No. The Lord used personification in the first book of the Bible to describe the justice that Abel's innocent blood demanded. And the same is true in the last book of the Bible. The innocent blood of martyrs is represented as crying out for justice from beneath the altar of burnt offering. We'll see that it's the altar of burnt offering in just a moment. Personification is a literary device, in this case a very concise and powerful way of crying out for justice. In other words, implying injustice has been done. These are martyrs unjustly slain because of the Word of God and the testimony they man maintained. They say, How long, Sovereign Lord? This blood is crying out, O oh God, Almighty God, Sovereign, having sovereign power over everything, how long are you going to let this go on? We know that your ways are holy and true, but how long until you judge the wicked actions of the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood. That means to avenge means to pay back. How long are you going to let this go on? And we'll ex notice the answer in just a moment. But I want you to notice four texts that concern the altar of burnt offering in the Old Testament. Many people say the altar of burnt offering is not seen in heaven's temple, and this is not true. In fact, the altar of burnt offering is the altar where these souls are crying out. And how do we know this? All right, here are four Old Testament references. Leviticus 8.15 Moses slaughtered the bull and took some of the blood and with his finger he put it on all the horns of the altar to purify the altar. He poured out the rest of the blood where? At the base of the altar. So he consecrated it to make atonement for it. So where did Moses pour the blood of the bull after he consecrated the altar? The Bible says at the base of the altar. All right, let's go to Exodus 29, 12. The Lord said to Moses, Take some of the blood's bull's blood and put it on the horns of the altar with your finger and pour out the rest of it at the base of the altar. 
So this is where Moses was told to do it, and we just read in Leviticus, that's exactly what he did. And where did the blood go? At the base of the altar. Look at Leviticus 4.18. He, that is the high priest, is to put some of the blood on the horns of the altar that is before the Lord in the tent of meeting. The rest of the blood he shall pour out at the base of the altar of burnt offering. No blood is poured out at the base of the altar of incense, only at the base of the altar of burnt offering, because that's where the animals, animals are slaughtered. So according to Leviticus 4.18, the blood is poured out at the base of the altar of burnt offering, which stands at the entrance to the tent of meeting. And our last text is Leviticus 9.9. 9. Talking about Aaron's sons, his sons brought the blood to him. He dipped his finger into the blood, and he put it on the horns of the altar, and the rest of the blood he poured out at the base of the altar. In the wilderness temple, the blood of sacrifices was poured into a container that was kept at the base of the altar. When the container became full, the innocent blood of the sacrifices was removed and buried in the ground. The language that John uses, and he says, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and the testimony they had maintained, indicates three things. A, these martyrs are sacrifices. This is the reason their souls are represented as being under the altar. Because this is where the blood of sacrifices was kept. The second thing this language tells us, these end-time martyrs will die after the fourth seal is broken. In other words, this is the fifth seal. This passage in Revelation concerning these martyrs is not concerned with martyrs who died through the centuries. These particular saints who die under the fifth seal have not yet died because the fifth seal has not yet been broken. They will be martyred when the fifth seal is broken because they will take a bold and defiant stand against the demands of Babylon at that time. Because of the faith of Jesus that is given to them, they would rather die than to disobey God, and this is why they are killed. Now, the third thing that we learn from this language in Revelation, these particular saints will be given the grace and faith necessary to take such a bold stand. This uncommon courage, this holy boldness, will come as an enabling gift from Jesus. Jesus grants a martyr's faith when a martyr's faith is needed. What a Savior. Amen and amen. The fifth seal will be broken when the sixth trumpet sounds. And during the sixth trumpet, the final call for salvation will be given. Let me look at the, the final call here for just a moment. In Revelation 18.4, John writes, Then I heard another voice from heaven say, Come out of her, my people. We're talking here about the harlot, the great whore, that's described in Revelation 17. Come out of her, my people, so that you will not share in her sins, so that you will not receive any of her plagues. For her sins are piled up to heaven, and God has remembered her crimes. Give, her, give back to her the torture, the persecution that she has given. Pay her back 200%. Pay her back double for what she has done. Mix her a double portion from her own cup. I'm here to tell you in plain English that God is going to double the torture God is going to avenge the death of his martyrs and the suffering of his saints by giving back double to all those who participate 
in the persecution. Those who persecute, God will deal with them by giving back to them double, 200% for what they have done. I'm telling you, the seven last plagues um, defy description. The wrath of God has never been seen quite like this. And we're going to behold it with our own eyes. Let's go back to the computer screen. At the same time that the fifth seal is broken and the call to come out of the great harlot is given, there's another voice speaking from heaven. And it says, write this down, John. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. From this point forward, Revelation 14, 13 aligns precisely in the apocalyptic structure with the fifth seal. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Blessed are the martyrs who die in the Lord from this point forward. Yes, says the Spirit, they will rest from their labor, for their deeds will follow them. Martyrdom will bring rest to the saints from the suffering and travail of the great tribulation. And those who die a martyr's death under the fifth seal will be specifically blessed. These martyrs will sleep through the seven last plagues. That in itself is a blessing. <laughs> but, here's the blessing. They will be resurrected shortly before Jesus appears in a special resurrection. Every martyr will be resurrected shortly before the second coming to behold the victory of Jesus over his enemies. Look at these two texts. Daniel 12.12 12 says, Blessed is the one who waits for and endures to the end and reaches the end of the 1335 days. Blessed is that person. <laughs> when one seminar lady said, I take Daniel 12.12 12 rather literally that there will be only one saint living by the time Jesus gets here. <laughs> Blessed is the one. <laughs> Blessed are those who wait for and reach the end of the 1335 days. And Revelation 14.13 says, And blessed are those who die in the Lord from now on. So what is the promised blessing? One of the greatest blessings human beings can receive is to behold the victorious appearing of Jesus in clouds of glory. Now when I say victorious, I'm referring to something very specific here. Beholding the victory of Jesus. One of the greatest blessings human beings can receive is to personally and physically behold the victorious appearing of Jesus in clouds of glory. This display of Jesus' glory and his victory will never happen again, for never again will God have a planet in rebellion. Yes, those who are resurrected at the second coming will see a revelation of Jesus Christ that has never occurred and will never occur again. But the martyrs will be resurrected to see the Paul Harvey, <laughs> the rest of the story that they participated in a few days earlier. See, the seven last plagues are only 70 days in length. So some of the martyrs are only dead a couple of months, some are longer. But um, the whole idea here is that the martyrs will be resurrected to see the victory of Jesus, and they will behold with their own eyes the destruction of God's enemies. This is why the Scripture says, you know, in Matthew 25, Come, ye blessed of my Father, 
Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. This special resurrection occurs a few days before Jesus actually gets here. And it's also the same special resurrection that occurs so that those who crucified Christ are alive as well. They are resurrected to see Jesus appear. And so everyone is there watching and waiting to behold this marvelous display of glory. Okay, let's go back to Revelation 6 verse 9. And I want to read the fifth seal again. When he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been sacrifi sacrifices slain because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus, which they had maintained. They called out in a loud voice, How long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the wicked actions, the wicked, uh, for their actions, and avenge our innocent blood. Then each of them was given a white robe, and they were told to wait a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and brothers who were to be killed as they had been was completed. Until the number of their fellow servants who were to be killed as they had been, was completed. Hmm. This phrase tells us that God has already determined the number of saints that He will allow to be sacrificed. If the Father was willing to sacrifice Jesus for the salvation of one person, and we but faintly appreciate all that Jesus really is, how many human beings do you think God would be willing to sacrifice for the salvation of one person? In God's economy, the martyrdom of 10,000 people for the salvation of one is a reasonable exchange because God has the power of life. What God doesn't have is control over our will. The power of choice is ours. Also notice that both prophets and saints will be killed during the fifth seal. Many, if not all, of the 144,000 will be killed during the Great Tribulation. Notice what John said, told. And they were told to wait a little longer until the number of their fellow servants, servants and brothers, who were to be killed as they had been, was completed. The servants are the servants, the prophets, which are the 144,000. Revelation 7, 3. Do not harm the land or the sea or the trees until we put a seal on the foreheads of the servants of our God. So the servants are the 144,000 sealed from all the tribes of Israel. And in Revelation 10, 7, but in the days when the seventh angel is about to sound his trumpet, the mystery of God will be accomplished just as he announced to whom? his servants, the prophets. What I'm trying to show you is that the Apostle John keeps a careful distinction between servants and non-servants throughout the book of Revelation. Notice this text. I'm talking here about the third bowl. The third angel poured out his bowl. Now remember, this is just a few days before the second coming. The third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and springs of water, and they became blood. This third bowl is God avenging the death of his martyrs. Watch this. Revelation 16, verse 5. Then I heard the angel in charge of the waters say, You are just in these judgments, you who are and who were the Holy One, because you have so judged. For they have shed the blood of your saints and prophets. So, think, think about this. Who is getting the third bowl? Murderers. Those who killed the saints. For they have shed the blood of your saints and prophets. Now, what prophets are alive in the final days of earth's history? 144,000 servants, the prophets. 
The third bowl is God avenging the cry that we hear in the fifth seal. How long, O Lord, before you avenge our blood? Well, the angels say you are just in these judgments. You've given them blood to drink. They were bloodthirsty? Good. Give them blood to drink. For they have shed the blood of your servants, of your saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink as they deserve. What this means is that during the Great Tribulation, during the third bowl particularly, when the wicked who murdered all these saints and prophets go to get a drink of water, it will turn to blood. There will be no water for them to drink. Only blood. How disgusting will that be and how long will they endure that? I tell you, dealing with God is dealing with the ultimate in wrath. But one more text I want you to look at, Revelation 18, 24. Speaking of the great harlot, in her, the great harlot, was found the blood of prophets and of saints. If she doesn't yet exist, what prophets could there be unless the 144,000? The point here is that a great injustice is coming upon the saints and the 144,000, but God will use this injustice to His glory. The maddening wine, the intoxicating doctrines of false religions, will cause the leaders of the world to act irrationally after the fourth seal is broken. And insanity will rule the day. A spirit of confusion and anxiety will overtake the world. And when religious and political leaders behold the sudden destruction of 25% of mankind, they will go berserk in their efforts to appease God because they do not know God or His plans. This explains how in their misguided efforts to appease God, the 144,000 and the saints will become objects of hatred because they will refuse to obey the decrees and laws of Babylon. Well, well, we're out of time for this segment, but I hope you're beginning to get the underst understanding that Jesus is going to give a martyr's faith to all of these sacrifices so that as these people willingly die their testimony their death will be the most powerful testimony to the gospel of Jesus and his saving truth that a human being can offer we'll talk more about this in our next segment may God bless you is my prayer